welcome. Uh, for those who are just joining us, thank you all for um, hanging out with us a little bit before. And for those who are just joining, um, my name is Mariah Flynn. I use she, her pronouns. I am the director of our community coalition, the Burlington Partnership for a Healthy Community. Um, I'm really excited to have you all here with us for um, what is one of my favorite uh, Burlington Partnership for a Healthy Community events. Um, this is our 12th annual Roots of Prevention Awards. Um, I'm actually really looking forward to hearing from some of the speakers who are talking about the awardees tonight um, and learning more about what folks are doing. Um, uh, it just seems really amazing all the work that's being done in Burlington. Every time I read the nominations, um, I learn new things that are happening. Um, I'm also really excited to hear from Will Jones and Monica Hutt, who have some um, great experience with an insight into both commercial um, cannabis at a national and a local level, as well as, um, as well as prevention and healthy communities. So thank you to both of them for joining us. Um, normally, this would be part of an in-person event where I go over where the exits and the restrooms are. Um, but if you don't know how to find your own restroom, I cannot help you with that. Um, so I will just say, take care of yourself as you need to. Um, we would love to see your face on camera uh, so we can all share the event together. But if you need to have your camera off, that's fine too. Um, I love that a nice part of virtual events is the flexibility. Um, so uh, usually I get myself a new outfit for our Roots of Prevention Award celebration so that I do not um, duplicate in pictures what I look like. Um, at least that's how I um, that's how I justify it to myself every year. Um, but for uh, the virtual events, you will never know if I'm wearing the same sweatpants I wore last year or not. So I think we just come as we are and um, enjoy our time together for a little bit. Um, and we'll try to stay on time so that um, those of you who've been in long virtual meetings all day um, have a chance to take a screen break too. Um, oops. So if you need it, you should see a slide now with how to change your name. And pronouns if you are currently listed as my office or owner or Joe's iPhone, you can take a minute and change it to your full name and pronouns so that we can greet each other in the chat. Um, I'll ask that while the speakers are talking, while the um, while our keynote is talking, um, maybe take a break from chat for a little bit just so we can listen and not be distracted, but feel free during the rest of the celebration um, to chat at, at as you'd like and um, interact with one another. Um, let's see. And I'll just mention one more time that our silent auction is live and um, we close at midnight. We're not gonna take a stretch break, sorry. Um, I'm just gonna take that right off actually. There we go. So our silent auction is live. It's gonna close at midnight tonight. Um, and um, I encourage you to check it out um, because I, like um, silent auctions uh, virtually are great. Um, instead of slyly trying to beat someone out um, while the event is going and um, anonymously trying to get over there, you can just anonymously bid from home, set a proxy bid, let the site do all the work for you. Um, and Jill from next door will never know it's you that bid her out for the um, for the um, oil, the um, olive oil things um, until you invite her over for dinner or something. Um, so I have been the lucky leader of the Burlington Partnership for a Healthy Community for more than 14 years now. Um, I am continually impressed with the compassion and the commitment of so many people in our community doing important work to support health and wellness in Burlington. Um, I recognized a lot of the people's names who registered, but there's some new folks here too today who don't know us. Um, so I just wanted to briefly share a little bit about what we do. Um, our mission is to address the causes and consequences of substance misuse in Burlington. Um, if you were on earlier, you might have seen a few ways that we do that. Um, we support kids to learn skills, to empower them to be leaders for health and improvement in their community. Um, we support public education and raise awareness of important substance use, prevention issues. 
Um, and then we have a program for parents and teens. Um, Parent In is one example of kind of how we get information out to people. Um, you can find that on social media or at Burlington uh, or at parentinburlington.org. Um, and you'll receive text tips and uh, or you'll receive tips and resources to help you prevent youth substance use or just healthy development for kids. Um, but I think one of the most important things that we do is challenge adult behavior and social norms that support substance misuse and um, disproportionately impact some populations that already have been impacted by inequitable systems um, and targeted by a commercial industry that um, needs to get people using substances early and often uh, to make a profit. So it's important that we have protective factors in our community, more protective factors than we have risk factors in Burlington if we wanna reduce substance misuse. Um, so we imp support improvements to policy and practice that make healthy choices easier for community members. Um, and we have lots of partners that we work with, but folks like Becca McCray and Dan Cahill and Shay Totten and Robin Friedner McGuire are all working on a little piece of that on their own as well. Um, and what I love most about this work is how all those pieces work together to create an environment that supports us all. Um, I stressed this at our last event, but I probably will just keep saying it every time because I don't think I can say it enough. The most effective way to prevent substance misuse is when the healthiest behavior is the easiest and most accessible to make for everyone. Um, so we've got some work to do. Um, for that, but today I just want to celebrate those folks that are doing that work already. Um, and that um, also brings me to our keynote. So often we, um, we use this event to uh, invite local leaders um, as the keynote to make connections between public health and the work that, of the local organizations and the individuals and what they're doing to support protective factors. Um, but with cannabis commercialization beginning soon in Vermont, this year, um, we wanted to invite a speaker with more expertise about that issue and the impact it has on local communities. Um, one thing that I can share from the work that I do, um, the work that we've been doing, is that people are really confused about cannabis. <laughs> um, the laws are changing, the way we, the language that we're using to talk about it is changing, the research is constantly growing and changing, and we're learning, learning new things all the time. Um, and it is really hard to keep up. It's hard for me to keep up. And I do this for a job all the time. I'm constantly reading about it. Um, oh, we had one of our parent in workshops recently, um, a local child psychiatrist, Dr. David Ratu said he had never seen a substance with such a big disconnect between the, what the research says and what people believe about the substance as cannabis. Um, so we all have a lot of catching up to do. And, uh, I think our work in it, or of our organization is to help the community keep catching up, but we've invited Will to share some lessons learned from other states and help us support a Burlington where everyone has equal access to healthy choices and public health is prioritized above, um, above all. Um, so Will Jones is the director of the Community Engagement and Outreach at Smart Approaches to Marijuana. He comes from a legacy of civil rights leaders in Washington, DC. He's an experienced speaker and community activist. Um, he works on issues of social justice at the local and national level. He partnered with drug policy advisors and leaders in DC um, in 2014 to found Two is Enough DC to raise awareness of the predatory practices of commercial industries targeting communities of color with substance use and helping to reduce marketing and improve policies that drive the inequities. Um, he's been featured on TV, radio, print outlets, talking about cannabis policy. One of the reasons that uh, we invited him is that so many of our staff and our partners had seen him on various things and really appreciated his perspective. He's been on NBC, Reuters TV, CBS, BBC World, Al Jazeera, C-SPAN, Washington Post, Huffington Post. Um, he's earned an MPA from George Washington University in the School of Public Policy and Administration. And then um, just like all of us, we have lots of different experiences that bring us um, to this room. And he's also a husband and a father and serves as a DC firefighter and EMT. So Mr. Jones, thank you so much for joining us today. We are so excited to have you. I invite you to unmute your phone and talk and I'm gonna uh, mute myself.
Thanks for that introduction. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, it's great to be here with you all and share um, share as a keynote speaker. Um, and congratulations to those that are uh, receiving awards this evening for your work in prevention. I think that's such uh, it's an important field, um, and the work that you do is so important. So, um, congratulations to you. Um, I'm going to talk about perhaps what may be the next frontier in prevention uh, for you all there in Vermont and definitely in other states. And that has to do with cannabis policy um, in legalization, as I know that's coming to you all, I believe in October of this year. And so I'm gonna give a brief overview of kind of what the field is looking like right now, um, but also specifically focusing on um, how legalization has been impacting uh, minority communities. I know that's one of the things that was discussed in one of the uh, questions earlier this evening about um, advertisements, the level of saturation of advertisements in certain communities. And so that's something that you guys are already aware of. So I just want to help us, I guess, see, you know, as we're celebrating the work that's already been done to also kind of give a preview of maybe how the work may change in the future and just things to be aware of um, in data and trends that are happening um, so that you all can continue to do uh, the great work that you are doing. So let me share my screen. Hope that works. Um, there we go. Um, so again, I'll be focusing um, more narrowly on specifically on the impact of uh, legalization and commercialization in uh, communities of color and the intersection with social justice, but I think there will be some things that will broadly apply just across legalization as well. And we, since we just have 10 minutes, I am going to be going through this faster uh, than I might ordinarily go through it, um, but my contact information will be at the end and very happy to dig deeper into any one of these slides, um, you know, to follow up with anyone, whether that's by email or phone conversation or even over Zoom, you know, I'm happy to dig deeper on any of the topics that I touched on. Um, so um, when it comes to marijuana legalization, there's three core arguments. And actually, if you forget that, just for anyone that's not aware of the organization that I work with, Sam um, here, I'll say we're a bipartisan national organization and we work on issues of marijuana policy at the local and federal level. We provide education as well as working with legislators. Um, and uh, our goal really is to see marijuana policy move forward in a way between the extremes of, uh, incarceration and arrests on one hand, I think we've had, we all are aware of some of the harms of just treating substance abuse as a criminal justice issue. Um, but we're also want to avoid the extremes of commercialization on the other hand. And so we're navigating that space in between that um, in ways that can move marijuana policy forward in a way that doesn't negatively impact public health. Um, so back to these three core uh, arguments, and that's arrest and incarceration, business equity initiatives, and reinvesting in communities harmed by war and drugs. Those are the most common uh, topics that I've heard uh, in this space. Uh, again, specifically when we're talking about um, issues of social justice and marijuana legalization. So I wanna analyze these things really quickly, just give a bird's eye view of what's going on in this space. And again, things that we can look out for in the future. Um, I think it's really important though to start out to remember our past and not that long ago in, in all of our lifetimes in, in the 90s, um, executives from Big Tobacco from RJ Reynolds said stuff like we don't smoke that shit, we just sell it, we reserve the right to smoke for the young, the poor, the black and the stupid. That was their explicit uh, marketing tactics in, um, in our lifetimes. Um, and so we have to be very aware because um, one of the questions that I often pose people, actually, that I always pose people and why I have this slide up is, um, why do we think things will magically change if these same companies are just selling a different product, right? And, and so here you see in these slides, and again, if you do not remember anything else that I say in this presentation, if the rest is kind of boring and droning on, uh, you know, I hope you remember this slide and this question sticks in your mind. Um, but you see here in, in this, um, that's me and my daughter actually a couple of summers ago. Now I went to get her some ice cream at the nearest convenience store to us. Um, and this is what it looks like in 2022. Um, and, uh, you know, the closest store where, where I lived at the time and when I began working on this issue, the closest store to my house in any direction was a liquor store. 
And so um, I think we need to think honestly, if these companies that you see here and you know, the pictures behind me are now just selling a different product, why do we believe that they will, um, that anything will change in terms of how they market, who they target and who has the most negative health impacts from these uh, addictive, um, addictive products. Um, and so we're seeing a lot of similarities between the tobacco and alcohol industries. We're seeing investments from big tobacco industries over uh, nearly $2 billion from Altria, uh, Philip, uh, which is the parent company of Philip Morris. Uh, we've seen investments from the alcohol industry. So uh, Molson Coors, Corona, uh, Blue Moon, Heineken, and others. Um, again, in, in this is a very lucrative industry. The Washington Post said that it could bring in more than an NFL if it's legalized at the national level. And so to me, what I see taking place, um, how it appears to me, is that issues of uh, injustice are being appropriated um, by corporations and by businesses that are looking for a way to um, uh, to change the law so that they can, you know, for profit, for their profit. And so, you know, just as an example, this was the campaign that was ran in D.C. that said legalization ends discrimination. And I always say, if you think that the systemic issues of discrimination and inequality in our country or your state are going to be solved simply by creating a new lucrative industry, you have a naive and very shallow at best understanding of the depth of these issues in the United States and how they persist still in 2022. Um, and in many ways, we see the you know, history repeating itself again, tobacco companies that not that long ago were partnering with organizations in minority communities. Uh, in this quote from Brown and Williamson, uh, tobacco company is, is really insightful. It said, clearly the sole reason for BMW's interest in the Black and Hispanic communities is the actual and potential sales of BMW products within these communities and the profitability of these sales. This relatively small and often tightly knit minority community can work to BMW's marketing advantage if exploited properly. And I will repeat that last line, if exploited properly. That's what these companies are doing, and they're on the right where you see PACS, um, Marijuana Policy Project, and House Plant making the same types of partnerships, inroads in minority communities um, that tobacco companies did in the past. And this is important, again, if you're a brand like PAX or House Plant or whatnot, you want to have that instant name recognition, that instant brand recognition uh, in a community with your product. And so we're seeing, again, some of the same patterns take place, unfortunately. Um, these are just some quick images um, on the left. Um, you see Big D Liquors and, and Benning Heights Market. Those were, again, when I'd be working on this issue, some of the actually the closest stores to my house. Uh, and on the right, we see, you know, some uh, marijuana related businesses in Colorado looks really similar to me, but more importantly, I think is the placement uh, to more importantly to be aware of is the placement. Um, they're disproportionately located in communities of color, one pot shop for every 47 residents in Denver, Colorado, more pot shops than Starbucks and McDonald's combined. And so I say, you know, just to paint that picture, imagine you're walking down the road, uh, you see a McDonald's or a Starbucks, replace that with a dispensary, add some more, and that's the level of saturation that we're talking about, particularly in minority communities. Um, and so I'm going to breeze through these again. I, I've used up uh, most of the time already, but I want to give just, again, a bird's eye view of what's happening in terms of arrest and incarceration in the other two topics. Um, so even the ACLU found that extreme racial disparities in marijuana arrests persist even in legalized or decriminalized states. Um, and what we're seeing is that even though there have been reductions in certain categories of uh, marijuana uh, arrests, um, very specific categories of arrests, marijuana related arrests, the overall rate of uh, arrests of African Americans in Colorado, Denver, and in other states as well has remained unchanged or even gone up in these states since then. And again, to me, this is because there's a systemic underlying issue that is not being addressed. And even if marijuana is legal, if you haven't dealt with those underlying issues, holding people that enforce the law with bias accountable, um, holding those departments accountable, um, then you're going to have the same issues pop up in just a different excuse. Maybe they'll say, well, it's legal, but you have too much on your person or you're using it in a place where you shouldn't, or there's a whole host of excuses. And I don't want to paint law enforcement with a broad brush, brush either and say that all of them you know, enforce the law with bias. But for those that do, they should be held accountable. Legalization does not hold them accountable. And so we see uh, persistent, if not increased bias in arrests, um, depending on, you know, there's multiple ways to interpret this data, but we can just say, again, overall arrests increased. Um, certain on-view on arrests are more likely. 
uh, in Colorado in the years following legalization for, for Blacks uh, than prior to legalization. Um, the juvenile arrest rate, this is very important, school to prison pipeline, because it's still illegal under the age of 21. Minority youth, according to the data, best available data, that was from the Colorado Division of Criminal Justice, um, saw that there was actually, while it did actually drop a small bit for white youth, I think 5%, it increased 35% for Latino youth and 54% for, uh, for Black youth. So just things we got to be aware of moving forward. Um, adult arrests kind of already touched on that. And I, again, I'm not going to dig through all these numbers, but just to show we're tracking them, we're talking about them, and the trends are that even after legalization, that the um, there is no significant decrease in, in arrests, in Black arrests. In Massachusetts here, you see a decrease after 2020, um, that's when COVID hit. So every state across the board saw significant reductions in arrests after when COVID hit. And the same story with the incarcerated population. I know in DC, our prison population was decreasing for several years prior to legalization. Same thing in Colorado. And then for some reason, uh, after legalization, that decrease changed to an increase. I don't have time to fully break down this slide, but just to say there is no state that post legalization in the years following legalization saw any significant uh, reduction in their um, prison populations, while, um, and this is what the second dotted lines are, there actually were some significant reductions in prison populations on legislation that was passed that was actually specifically narrowly targeted at criminal justice reform. So it's an interesting contrast there and why, in my opinion, marijuana legalization is stealing the oxygen from the room from greater reforms that could be done in this space. Um, just California, again, don't have time to break down what's happening there, but just in the, there was a, if you go back here, there was a small bump, not huge, but in 2017, small bump in uh, their prison population, which is right after they legalized, and then it continued on its prior trajectory. Uh, business equity initiatives, um, people, you know, I think this quote from the founder of the um, National Diversity and Inclusion Cannabis Alliance is, is very insightful. It says people had dreams and hopes of building generational wealth, and it's done just the opposite. It's ruining lives at this point. Um, because these promises of equity are not being upheld nationally, it's still less than 4% ownership by, um, by African Americans in the cannabis industry, um, you know, even within the medical marijuana industry, which has been around a little bit longer, even in places like New Jersey, where it's been there for 10 years, only one license holder was black, um, and so there's a lot of concern by people that are excited about legalization, but are seeing, hey, this is actually hurting, not harming. The equity isn't being realized and people that have made investment, made dreams um, and things like that um, are really just being left out to dry and, it, and it's creating um, hurt uh, rather than help. Um, one other quote I'll just highlight uh, is time is really up on selling your business dream as a social justice movement. And this is from the president of the Minority Cannabis Business Association. And so then again, you see headline after headline after headline repeating the same story that the promises, and, and they sound wonderful. I will be the first to say that these things sound great. But the reality is, again, headline, 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 and so many more, the, they're not materializing. The systems of inequality are still in place. And so and we're not seeing the promises for equity take place. Uh, just more headlines, again, don't have time to break all of this down, but just to show you that there is so much uh, that's there and that is not being addressed by legalization when it comes to uh, equity initiatives. And then lastly, uh, reinvesting in communities harmed by the one drugs. Again, great idea, same kind of concept of though, uh, kind of, I almost call them like campaign promises of legalization, right? And then what actually happens is, um, you know, the racial wealth gap is actually being compounded, not helped. And just to emphasize that point, I have a very short video from Congresswoman Ocasio-Cortez. Um, and I, I like, it's less than a minute. And I like sharing this video because, um, again, for our organization, Sam, this is not a, shouldn't be a partisan issue. Sometimes it is, but it shouldn't be. And so we're looking at what people are saying on both sides of the aisle and then trying to take a step back and say, so what, what are the overall takeaways that we can have from this? So, um, you know, she is an advocate for legalization, but even she is, is, is saying, hey, this is compounding the racial wealth gap, not helping. So I'm going to play that really quick. Let me make sure I have my audio shared, uh, share computer sound, and then I will be done. compounding the racial wealth gap right now um, based on who is getting the first mover advantage.
according to an industry trade publication, 73% of cannabis executives in Colorado and Washington are male, 81% are white. In the state of Massachusetts, um, just 3.1% of the marijuana businesses in the state were owned by minorities, and just 2.2% were owned by women. Is this industry representative of the communities that have historically bared the greatest brunt of injustice based on the prohibition of marijuana? Absolutely not. It doesn't look like any of the people who are reaping the profits of this uh, are the people who were directly impacted. That is correct. And so, um, again, just wanted to share that to say people on both sides of the aisles are seeing that a lot of these promises aren't panning out. And again, I bring it back to that initial image I showed in question of, you know, why do we think anything's magically going to change just because new corp you know, sorry, old corporations are selling a new product. Um, we already know how they operate. We know who they harm the most. Um, and you guys work in prevention. So um, I think, you know, we just have to be aware of this new frontier moving forward. Um, this is just a personal side. I always tell people kind of what's my why, why am I motivated to continue working on this issue and be passionate. And when a lot of people tell me, you know, they're like, hey, the train's already left the station. Why are you saying anything? And for me, it's just important to say uh, what my truth is, um, to share that. I have that in my family history. That's my great grandfather and great uncle. They were the first to sit in desegregate schools in Washington, D.C. Um, and I, I draw an interesting contrast on the right there. You have John Boehner, who's now going to make $24 million if marijuana is legalized at the federal level. And I say, you know, there's not always a big paycheck at the end of the day if you're doing the right thing. Um, and yeah, I know you all working in prevention, you would love it too if, if your paycheck for working there in the community was $24 million. Unfortunately, we don't always have that paycheck, but um, the work that you guys are doing is so important. And that's uh, something to be proud of. Um, and that's why I continue to speak out on this issue. Um, so that, you know, I can look back and say, hey, I spoke up, I, I shared, I did my best to, to speak the truth um, as, you know, as we're moving into this new frontier of marijuana legalization, commercialization. Um, this is, again, my contact information. So happy to continue the conversation or dig deeper into any of the slides or topics that I went through. I think it went a little bit over, but I hope that was some good information for you all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Will. Thank you for your patience with us as we got things going and for doing this and for multitasking through all of it. Um, that was amazing and impressive. And uh, I don't know how long you'll be able to stay on with us. I know you're going to have to jump off, but thank you for coming and for your time today. Um, we really appreciate it. Um, and we will um, try, <laughs> hopefully we can make uh, the sound quality workout and uh, make just a quick little chunk of that portion of Will's um, presentation that folks can watch later too. It has a separate piece. Thank you. And you're getting a lot of fantastics in the chat, Will. Thank you for your time. Um, and for joining us from DC and now go fight a fire, I'm guessing, or um, <laughs> whatever you need to do to save the world next. Um, I want to invite um, to bring it back to our state and uh, Vermont and the things that are happening here. Um, we've invited Monica Hutt, who's the Chief Prevention Officer for the state of Vermont to share a few words um, about the state of our state as it relates to prevention and what's happening at a state level that impacts um, how we might think about our next steps in Burlington too. Um, so Monica has been working for the state of Vermont with positions in the Agency of Human Services, the Department of Children and Families. She was appointed as commissioner of the Department of Disabilities, Aging and Independent Living um, in 2015. And then um, just in 20, 2021, accepted the governor's appointment to chief prevention officer for the state. Um, so she has been um, really instrumental um, um, also in the human service field, working in a variety of different um, um, human service positions, um, also as the executive director of the Sarah Holbrook Center here in Burlington years and years ago. Um, so she has some strong connections to this community as well. Um, in her role as chief prevention officer, she serves as the governor's liaison to the Cannabis Control Board. Um, and I've been really um, just excited to see you in this position, Monica, because um, I've just been so grateful for how approachable and genuine you are as a human, um, but also the what a champion you've been for our work and for health and um, thinking about more upstream work that we do in our state. Um, uh, in addition to our crisis intervention. So thank you for being here and go ahead. 
Well, and thanks for having me. I will just say it's kind of funny that Will's camera kept going dark because I have, I'm in fear that mine will as well. My husband, I think just to amuse himself during COVID, installed motion detector lights in our basement, which is where I'm sitting. So every once in a while they go off. So I have to stand up and do crazy things to make them go back on. So he's amused and I'm almost always in the dark down here. So if that happens, I'll do some waving and hopefully be back on. Um, Will was amazing. I could have listened to him for another hour just because I think so much of what he said was relevant. And I'm not gonna talk really specifically about cannabis, but just as a reminder for folks, Vermont is launching an adult use cannabis market in the next few months. Um, and I think that we're the only state in the country where this decision happened legislatively. Um, and the governor let that legislative um, process unfold and let that bill go into law without his signature and set a couple of really strong parameters and priorities for the market as it unfolded. If it was gonna happen as, a, as legislatively um, decided, he really wanted the market focused on safety, on prevention, and on the social equity pieces that Will referred to. And I'm realizing just in listening to Will talk that I probably need to dig a lot deeper into the social equity conversation to, to understand it. Um, but very recently, the, um, the Cannabis Control Board launched its initial kind of provisional licensing for cultivators and growers, just to kind of get a sense of what was happening in the state. And the reports that I get through the Cannabis Control Board is that the, there's a really good variety of, of kind of small, medium, and large with the emphasis on small, both retail establishments and growers that are applying, which I think is a good thing for Vermont. Um, but again, it's something that we're going to need to keep paying attention to. One of the things that Mariah asked me to think about was, you know, what was making me feel hopeful in this, in this world of substance use and prevention. And I have to say that I am shocked and pleasantly surprised by the number of conversations around prevention that are happening all over the state. I feel like it's all of a sudden gotten this huge boost. And I am wondering how much the community conversations that coalitions like Burlington have been able to lead around the, the cannabis conversation have kind of generated this energy in communities to think and talk and plan about substances. And although the conversation is a lot about cannabis, there's a, a great um, opening in the door to talk about substances across the board for our youth. So tobacco and, and opiates and alcohol, which I think sometimes kind of ebb and flow. So I'm actually feeling really hopeful about the world of prevention for the state of Vermont, because I think we're taking it really seriously for a variety of reasons, maybe some good reasons and some not so good reasons, but the conversations have been incredibly robust, which I think is wonderful. Um, and I also will say that I am hearing more and more that the conversations aren't stopping on one substance or even, or even just the issue of substance use, but they're really about prevention large, right, writ large. So people are talking about some of the co-occurring issues that we know some of our youth and some of our adults are facing in terms of mental health issues or poor physical health or all of those social determinants of health that need to be in place that can be negative or can also be part of our protective factors in building resilience. So I just feel like the conversation has gotten really robust and rich and that people are talking about prevention not as its own silo where it competes with other things for funding or attention, but as part of this entire continuum. Um, so in the substance use world, you know, really thinking about prevention as part of uh, the beginning of a continuum, which includes then treatment and recovery, right? But also thinking about it in terms of all of those other social determinants of health and the co-occurring issues that can happen with substance use. So it's not as if prevention is standing by itself anymore. It's got all of this support and energy from the other aspects of work along that continuum that I think are helping people to see it as a yes and. We don't have to fund prevention and not fund other things. We don't have to fund other things and ignore prevention. Um, I will also say that I really um, 
I am hopeful. And also the end of the legislative session is this really wild time where literally my phone is pinging almost constantly and something good has happened or something not so good has happened. And so I was hoping that at this point in time, I would be able to give you a quick update on what's going on legislatively, but literally nothing has been decided yet. It, it's all still very much in flux. And the legislature is also having really rich, robust conversations about prevention. So what I wanted to do, Mariah, was just give just a quick synopsis of some of the legislation and the bills that I'm paying attention to that I'm happy about or really concerned about to maybe just set the stage for all of you to kind of keep thinking and talking as we move forward. So I'm gonna start with the budget. Um, the governor, governor Scott proposed in the budget uh, funding for substance use disorder that really did hit that continuum. And there was a huge chunk of funding for prevention, a chunk of funding for intervention and treatment, and then a chunk of funding for recovery. So we started really strong with that continuum approach and recognizing the importance of prevention in a way that I don't think has been really done in the state before now. And it, the intention was to fund local coalitions like Burlington, across the state so that they could really stabilize and become a network that wasn't dependent on federal funds that tend to be much more um, fluid, but also, um, I was gonna say whimsical, and I realized that I probably don't want that word reported when I'm talking about federal funding, but a little, uh, a little less stable, sort of based on different substances, different strategies, but not operationally um, foundational for our coalitions. So this money was really meant to be operational funding for coalitions so that they could grow and thrive and strengthen and be responsive to communities and community need. Um, that funding has ebbed and flowed throughout the session. It's come out, it's gone back in. Um, different bills have been introduced that, that sort of took the dollars that were intended for prevention coalitions. But at last count today, this morning, um, I think, I think it's back in the budget. The legislature has kind of understood the importance of it um, and it, it is in there at a slightly reduced amount. So that's really hopeful and exciting. Um, I want to now talk just about a couple of bills that are also in play. Um, H711 creates the Opioid Settlement Advisory Committee. Um, coming from all of the settlements that the Attorney General's office has worked out with the pharmaceutical companies around the opioid epidemic. And that money is designed to, to for abatement purposes and can be used for prevention. So that will be another source of funding, kind of trying to rectify the harm that was done through opiates and overprescribing opiates that will be available to the state of Vermont to use. So, so in a really very real sense, it's, it's, it's a reparation for harm that was done through the use of opiates, which I think has been, which will be great. Um, a couple of areas that I think are of concern um, that I wanted to just kind of share with you all. One is very specific to cannabis. The legislature had some very strong laws. I think that people have noted that Vermont created with the onset or the planning for the adult use market, really had a strong foundation in prevention and in safety. Um, one of the things that's most concerning to me right now is a bill, uh, it's H-548, which is the miscellaneous cannabis bill. And in that bill, the legislature walked back from a THC limit for uh, concentrates, can cannabis concentrates, um, the limit had been set at 60%, which is high, but is actually lower than most other states in the country that have um, moved into legalization. The, this bill actually eliminates that limit, um, which is of significant concern, I think, for everybody, because we know, as you said, Mariah, that there's more and more research out there about cannabis, cannabis use, um, cannabis-induced psychosis, and the higher the THC level, the more likely that is to have to happen, um, and the more risk it is for our kids. So that's a bill that we're really concerned about and paying attention to, and I really urge you all to just take a quick look at it. It's just literally one strike through in the bill, um, but it's a significant strike through. Um, 
I don't know that I need to go into any of the other bills. I've been trying to make sure that all the coalitions stay informed and sending out a spreadsheet pretty much once a week updating the bill so that you all can pay attention. But I will say that I just to, to kind of close us out, I am um, grateful to be in this position at a point in time where the conversations around prevention are as ubiquitous as they have become. Um, and when we're talking about that, we're talking about it really globally, cross substances, cross age, um, really trying to understand the root causes of substance use and how to build the kind of healthy communities that we wanna see. And I really have come to believe and understand that our local co coalitions are the only way to do that. You know, we can legislate, we can have, you know, state agencies that are doing the work that they need to do. But when it comes right down to it, it's really about community. It's really about reaching your community, connecting with people, building and creating the kind of buy-in that you need for both youth and adults to make a change and, and kind of pay attention on the ground. So I'm excited to be partnering with Mariah in this work and with all of our other coalitions and so excited for all of the awardees who I think really represent that continuum of social service, of protective factors, of social determinants in a way that build healthy communities for us. So I will stop there. Thank you so much, Monica, for your time this evening too, and for coming and kind of giving us a little state of the state and where things are um, and what we should be watching out for in the state house. I've been there's um, each session. There's always so many bills related to substance use that it's hard to keep up with, and things change as you all know. I'm sure for anyone who follows any bills that um, it changes so rapidly that it's been really great to have Monica to be able to. Um, highlight for us the things that we should be paying attention to. <laughs> um, thank you so much for your time, Monica, and for all the work that you're doing to champion prevention. Um, so uh, I was going to have us all take a little break now, um, but I think just in the interest of time and because we're a little bit behind where we planned to be at this point, I would say just stretch, maybe uh, give yourself a minute, stand up if you need to. Um, Yes, Becca will lead us in a stretch as the nurse here. She can show you all move, stand, move your body. Um, and we're just gonna power through so that you can get to the point of the night where a lot of you came for, which is to um, which is to talk about our awardees. Um, so before uh, the, you know, this part of the night, we talked a lot about um, our mission of uh, of issues that were related directly to our mission of preventing substance misuse. But now I wanna talk about um, the people in our community that are doing things that help people thrive um, and make it easier for um, our work. Um, so it's making it easier for us in our substance use prevention work. Um, every year we receive uh, nominations from folks that are doing um, important work in Burlington. And usually they're doing it without a lot of recognition. Um, just because it's needed, just like the folks that, um, that we're talking about today. Um, and 90% um, of the people who develop a substance use disorder starting, started using substances before they turned 18. Um, so delaying use and helping youth find other ways to cope and connect and feel valued um, are incredibly important. Um, and not just for youth, but it is one of the places where we, we spend our time. Um, and there are some folks in our community who are doing things that help pre uh, prevent substance use problems, that help create a layer of protection for folks that um, get in the way of those barriers to positive outcomes for folks, for kids and adults. Um, so I think the nominations that we got this year are just a good reminder of um, how many generous and dedicated and creative and supportive people we have in our community. Um, we don't have enough um, capacity to acknowledge everyone that's been nominated, but um, I know that there are a lot of others just like Becca and um, McCray and Dan Cahill and Shay Totten and Robin um, Friedner McGuire. Um, even the folks who are here today who continue to show up for their community and for health and wellness. Um, I have uh, 
reflected a lot over the years about this community. I was mentioning it a little bit earlier um, and about all the strengths that Burlington has. And I think that one of the things that I've noticed over and over again is that one of the biggest strengths of this community or this, this city is the people, the passionate people and organizations that just keep showing up day and day in and day out to make our community a better place. Um, sometimes like uh, Robin Friedner McGuire and Shay Totten, they are doing it by recognizing a problem in the community and not waiting for somebody else to fix it, but stepping up to do what's needed and making sure that others follow. Sometimes like Rebecca McCray, they are enhancing policies and resources so that all members of our community have access to health. Um, and then there's people like Dan Cahill who are dedicating their time and their talents to activities that increase connection and build community. Um, so thank you so much for all that you are doing in Burlington. Um, I wanted to just mention that we have a theme that uh, helps us think about um, uh, this award. Um, so we themed it on um, the roots of prevention because we think about our awardees as planting little prevention seedlings in the community. Each of them is an individual tree that is supporting the leaves and limbs that they're connected to. But for them and for all of us, there are, um, as there are more trees supporting healthy individuals and policies and practices in the community, the gaps between them all get smaller. And as a forest, we are stronger than any one individual tree and it provides an environment where everyone can flourish. Um, so I know that we can't uh, do a round of applause like I would like to do um, for our awardees at um, an in-person celebration, but maybe wave or hit the little reaction button. Um, just show your support for the folks who and all they have done in this community. You can also unmute and clap too if you'd like. <laughs> um, uh, I wanted to start us off by um, talking about our DG Weaver Award winner. So DG Weaver, as I mentioned um, earlier, if you were on um, during our pre-program uh, pre time, is that um, it was a late assistant principal of Burlington High School. We uh, give this annual award in his honor to a person associated with the Burlington schools who, like Mr. Weaver, is a positive role model and goes above and beyond to support healthy opportunities and activities for youth and either as a staff or a volunteer. Um, we started organizing this in his um, dedication 14 plus years ago now, 14 years ago, um, because of all the support that he had done in the Burlington School District to create healthy opportunities for kids. Um, so I wanted to invite um, uh, Evan to share uh, our speaker for uh, Rebecca today, which, who's Tom Flanagan, who couldn't be here tonight. There's quite a few things happening in the district this, <laughs> this evening, as uh, many of the folks who are uh, who had hoped to be here are also tasked with being other places. Um, but Tom has provided a video that we're going to play about Rebecca. And Evan, I don't think the sound is not playing. So give us just a minute to... We'll get there. This particular video, I just had a few little moments um, earlier, but... Um, I will say as Evan is um, playing the video that um, I'm excited to see some of Becca's family here tonight. So I um, actually know Becca from years ago. We went to school together um, and then just recently reconnected. And I will say that um, it's been really um, exciting to have you as a partner at the district, Becca, because she brings such a wealth of um, passion for policies and systems and effective, um, creating effective policies and systems and strategies that help support a larger number of people. So I'm just really grateful to have her. We'll try again, let's see how we go. Do. 
Okay, let me know if you can't hear it. This works during our trial. <laughs> Volumes all the way up. Hi, everyone. My name is Tom Flanagan, and I'm the superintendent of Burlington Schools. Can you hear it? I'm sorry I can't be there in person today. I'm honored to be able to share this video congratulating Becca McCray, Burlington School District's lead nurse, on winning the DG Weaver Award. Congratulations, Becca. Becca, as our lead district nurse and COVID response coordinator, you have researched, written, and implemented at least five different COVID response guidance protocols, set up surveillance testing for staff, contact traced at all hours of the night and weekends, handed out countless tests and swabbed countless noses. You've pushed us to be more cautious when we needed to be, and you assured me, our team, and your colleagues through anxious times. You advocated for student and staff safety at our district leadership meetings and at the state level with Secretary French, AOE representatives, and your nursing colleagues. And you urged us to follow the science, even when that wasn't popular. You have been available at all hours of the day to offer your colleagues both professional and even personal guidance around COVID. Even now, as restrictions loosen, I know you are working closely with the team to keep families and staff informed and safe. I know there are times when you've been exhausted and lost sleep or canceled plans to do this work. I know, I want you to know how grateful we are for your leadership and commitment in the most challenging time in our schools in this generation. We would not have made it through without you. Plus this, the plus side of this is that because we, do, we did do so many evening calls together, you, Russ and I, that Russ and I now are close friends with you, your boyfriend, John, and your dog, Barkley. And we will treasure that. We, uh, we were honored to nominate you for this award and thank you and thankful for having you in our district. Thank you, Becca McCray, for helping us shepherd us through this immensely difficult time with care, skill, and grace. And congratulations on this award. Our district, city, and state are better because of you. Thank you, Becca. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you all. Please do um, yes, use your, you can clap, you can shout, you can wave. Um, thank you, Becca, for all that you've done in the community. Um, like I said, we just really appreciate everything that you've done. Um, and uh, I want to just share. So we um, would normally be handing off to Becca a um, an award, but we can't because it's a virtual event. So I will just show you that we um, we work with a local artist who does um, the awards for us every year and makes a stained glass award that I will be presenting to you. Um, hopefully sometime soon that we can set up a time to come and bring that to you. Thank you so much for all of your work. Um, uh, in the Burlington community. Um, and Becca, you are welcome to say something if you would like, but also there is no, you do not have to. I'll say a few words. I am super honored um, to receive this award. And um, I, I couldn't have done this without um, the people I work with. Uh, without the trust that they put in me to do this work. I definitely could not have done this without the support of my family. Um, and as Tom said, yes, this work has interrupted many holidays and evenings and weekends. And, um, and I'm, I'm just so um, glad that I could provide um, some peace to the chaos of COVID and some clarity um, through wow. the work that I did um, at both the state and the local level. So um, thank you so much. And um, I'm very proud of Burlington schools for following the science. Yay, thank you. Awesome, thank you, Becca. Um, I will now invite um, 
Frank Lenti to come and talk to us about um, Dan Kelly Hayhill, who is receiving the Youth and Families Award. Okay, great. Thanks, Brian. Thanks for having me. I, I really appreciate having the opportunity to, to speak um, about Dan. And I was thrilled to hear that he was nominated for the Youth and Families Award. Um, I've known Dan for, for many years now, and I've always known him as a, a man about town. And, and over the years, I've, we, um, I remember thinking we had a good connection because of our competitive spirit, um, playing sports and staying active but really it was it's about over the years I've learned that Dan just likes being out there and and making our community great and being with with the people of our community so as as many may know Dan is a land steward for the city of Burlington Parks and Rec and I just was thrilled when I heard that he was receiving this award because the last few years I last few years I'd, I'd see Dan when we when we'd go down to the uh the uh, Don the Donahue Sea Caves at Arthur Park there in Burlington, right across from the high school in between North Avenue and and 127. And I always think like, because Dan Dan would um he would get people excited to get down there and do some work to do the shoveling and and create a uh, a real community down there in the winter. And this last two winters of especially, you know, with with the the pandemic and the 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 lack of opportunity to to do things socially and and you know get exercise indoors we were faced with um having to be outside and you know I, I mean I love being outside but not everyone loves being outside and winter's long but if you if you can find something to do during the winter it can be such a nice time and so if if people aren't aware Dan worked and created um, a real positive momentum to get the uh, the Sea Caves project going. Where there's we we'd have teams down there shoveling hockey rinks. There's ice. There's figure skating rinks. There's huge ribbon for people to skate down there. Um, people can come down to do um, ice skating. I mean, um, excuse me, cross country skiing and bring their dogs. And and it was really just a, a perfect way to to include all sorts of people to um, enjoy being outside. And, and the beauty of it is right in Burlington. And people, sometimes people don't even know that this, this wonderful resource is right in Burlington. But um, getting back to Dan, yeah, he transformed that sea caves area and he'll be the first to tell you that, you know, he's so modest, he'll, he'll say that it was the, the team that, as he'd always give the credit to all the people who were, who would help out. But Dan was the one who, who, was snow blowing at 10 o'clock in the evening time and back the next morning to, to tune it up right so it would be good for people to come down. And, and it, these last two years, it's been so important and more than ever to uh, get out and have healthy options and things to do um, since we've been so cooped up in isolation. And, and I just, it's just so important that this is, uh, this has really um, grown to what it is. And, um, um, let me see. I'm not the most eloquent speaker, but let me just check my notes here. Um, anyway, anyway, like, like I said, Dan will be the first to um, deflect any praise and in 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 recognize the, the folks he's helping out. But he's our inspirational leader at the Sea Caves, and honestly, it's all throughout town and and the work he does in his profession and also just as a community member. So. Dan, congratulations for receiving the Youth and Families Award. It's well deserved. You are our leader and you deserve it. Thanks so much. Congratulations, Dan. Thank you so much. Thank you, Frank, and thank you, Dan, for all of you you've done in the community. It was um, exciting to read about this project and also to just in speaking with Dan, um, I have the honor of telling people that they get the awards. Um, it was a real pleasure just to hear about the things you're doing. And I learned so much about um, all of the little ways that you're helping beyond just connecting folks and, and providing the resources and being out there to snow shovel, but also maybe providing some music and some fun for some, some extra uh, um, special events as well. So I really appreciate that. Thank you for everything you've done. 
Um, and you're welcome to say something, but there is no pressure and you do not need to. Sure, I'll say a few words. Um, well, first and foremost, thank you all. Um, and um, thank you, Mariah, Steph, Evan, for putting on this event. Something like this is not easy to do in this weird world that we're in, uh, figuring out how to gather. Um, so that's off to you guys for that. Um, yeah, and Frank, you know, he's right. I'm about to give credit to a bunch of other people. Um, but and actually, Frank deserves a lot of credit because I had the uh, the opportunity to do some traveling this year, and I uh, was in Mexico, and I got a text from Frank checking in about how things were looking for the sea caves this winter, which was a really helpful kind of nudge to get ready and think about how to mobilize. So Frank gets a lot of credit for this also, um, and there's a lot of community volunteers. Um, in particular, I want to call out um, Keith Hescock, who was really instrumental in helping teach us and learn how to do a lot of um, working with ice last winter um, that led into the momentum of this winter. Um, and tons of community volunteers. The beauty of this project is that we got a bunch of shovels and we put them out down at the sea caves. We do some snow blowing to keep things kind of cleared, but the community did a lot of the work uh, keeping, keeping it going. So um, that was a big part of it. Um, shout out to the Parks and Rec staff that I work with who had a lot to do with it. Um, we had um, uh, Ben Rogers, Olivia Wolf, and Paul Morris specifically were folks who just really were instrumental in, in helping mobilize the effort um, and working with me. Um, and just, I just want to say I love Burlington. I love all the people in Burlington. Um, I think we all share that together here. Um, but one of the things that's special about this project is it's, it's a it's a place, it's, it's one of our natural areas. We have a lot of wonderful nature in Burlington. And it's a special place where humans and non-humans can kind of come together and share an experience. Um, you know, there's lots of wildlife, there's lots of birds down there. Um, overall, just, just a, a wonderful thing. So thank you all for this recognition. Um, it's, it, it means so much and um, thanks, thanks for this great event. Yay, thank you all. <laughs> um, and same as I said to Becca, we will, I know Dan that you are actually not in Vermont at the moment, which is another joy of virtual events. We can all come from wherever we are. Um, so uh, when you are back in the state or at some point, we will um, make sure that you get your award as well. <laughs> Um, and now I wanted to invite um, uh, Pam McCarthy to come and speak about uh, Shay Totten and Robin Friedner McGuire and their award. They are both, oops, sorry, there we go. They are both receiving um, outstanding individual awards this year. Thanks a lot. Oh man, this is so great to be here tonight. Um, as you said, I'm Pam McCarthy. I'm the former president and CEO of Vermont Family Network and a longtime advocate for children, youth, and families throughout Vermont. I am so excited to be part of this evening. It is so great to have the opportunity to celebrate my wonderful colleagues, Robin Friedner McGuire and Shay Totten for their remarkable Mental Health First Burlington initiative and their tireless efforts or to bring the innovative and effective CAHOOTS model to Burlington to better support individuals and families dealing with mental health challenges. I've known Robin for many years as a dedicated organizer and successful advocate, first in Vermont's uh, marriage equality movement, and then in Building Bright Futures and Let's Grow Kids Early Childhood Systems Change work. When she called me a couple of years ago, to talk about her interest in making Burlington's mental health supports and services more responsive, effective, and impactful. I was absolutely floored by her passion and vision. As a leader of Vermont's Family Voices organization, I was immediately drawn in as a collaborative partner for Mental Health First BTV. And that was just the beginning. Robin quickly recruited others to this effort, including strong and knowledgeable folks from the ACLU, the Howard Center, and the Burlington community overall. In the spring of 2020, as a pandemic loomed over everything, we began to meet and share ideas via Zoom. And that is where I finally met Shay Totten, whose reputation had certainly preceded him. As a skilled and articulate journalist and political commentator, Shay had been involved in mental health advocacy for a long time. He was the perfect co-lead with Robin for Mental Health First BTV. 
As parents with lived experiences of Vermont's mental health system of care, Robin and Shay have been exceptionally authentic and compelling family leaders, consistently influencing positive change with their expertise, their wisdom, and their strong commitment to making things better. I can think of no better description for them than outstanding individuals. In this time where the need for person and family-centered mental health care is increasing daily, the work that Robin and Shay have done to lay the foundation for a Burlington-based CAHOOTS model deserves great recognition and continued investment. I'll leave it to these fearless leaders to tell you more about CAHOOTS. Congratulations, Robin and Shay. It's been a privilege working with you on this, and thank you. Thank you so much, Pam. Um, I, I know that maybe Robin or Shay wanted to say a few words. You're welcome to unmute yourself. You want to do rock, paper, scissors, Shay? <laughs> <laughs> Just here to go. Um, uh, Pam, thank you so much for that really thorough and sweet introduction. And I also just want to thank the organizers for this event tonight. I know it's it's hard, but I really appreciate all the work that went into it. And the only the only thing that I really want to add is just that I was so surprised when this came up because so many people were involved. A lot of people were involved in this and Pam named a few of them, um, but there were other families who participated. We had mental health providers who participated and there were people who were just constant supports all along the way. Anna Gephardt, she's on tonight. Um, she was such a cheerleader early on. Um, AJ Rubin, also from Vermont um, uh, Disabilities, also was really helpful. Um, and honestly, if it wasn't for Shay, who just has been so solid every step of the way, I just, Shay, appreciate you so much. You just are such a fierce advocate with a kind heart. I mean, you're amazing, and uh, the city's really lucky to have you, Vermont is. Um, and I also really want to just express my appreciation to Councillor Karen Paul, because it felt like we had almost like I, we had a lot of time under her belt doing some advocacy, and it felt like it was Karen who really kind of breathed life into the hope around this, um, and she has really committed herself to ensuring that her colleagues and the mayor really understood why creating something like CAHOOTS is so important. Um, and I mean, I guess just in short to describe it, it's, it's an alternative response to mental health um, crisis and, and folks who are also experience a crisis because of substance use and abuse that deploys not the police, but two individuals, an EMT and a mental health crisis intervention uh, worker, both of whom are well trained, many hours of training um, and in de-escalation and other strategies and then help connect people to resources. And that's a very Cliff Notes version of that, but I'm, I'm really thrilled that the city's moving forward. And I guess the last thing that I'll say is that I, through this process, I have spoken fairly frequently, I would say initially, um, but with a woman named Nikki Grennan, and she is Phil Grennan's daughter. And for those of you who don't know who Phil Grennan was, he was killed by police in a mental health crisis. He was a, a dad and a grandfather. And, um, you know, she advocated, I believe, with Shay early on, and she just on occasion would give me messages of encouragement from afar. She doesn't live in the stadium more. So I'm really pleased that thanks to the help of Shay and everybody else that this is moving forward and that, I, you know, we can say to Nikki that her father didn't, didn't die in vain and that real change is happening here in the city. So thank you for, for recognizing the work. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Robin. Um, and uh, Robin and Shay, we will make sure that you get your words as well. Um, and I just, uh, yeah, thank you all so much um, for all that you're doing. Um, 
Uh, we can't give our awardees the standing ovation that they deserve. So maybe everyone can give a collective wave or a clap or, um, you know, put a hit the reaction button on your panel to show your support for them and their efforts. Um, I really just appreciate the time that folks take to nominate people too, which is um, important to recognize who folks are and what they're doing in the community. Um, I um, have to say that I love reading the nominations for um, the Roots of Prevention Awards, but there are also a lot of unsung heroes in the community um, doing great work. Um, I'm usually the one that gets to call people and tell them that they've been nominated and chosen for the award. And um, it happened this year and it's happened many times in the years past that I hear from folks, um, I didn't think anyone noticed that I was doing this um, and how much work it went into, whatever the project was. Um, so with that in mind, I wanna say two things. First, to all the awardees, um, people noticed. Um, we appreciate all you're doing. Um, we know that there were many unseen contributions that you've made to support the community too, um, but you are seen um, and thank you. Um, and for everyone else, um, don't forget to tell people that you notice and appreciate what they're doing. Sometimes it feels a little bit awkward, but do it anyway. Um, we all need people to see us and recognize our efforts. Um, probably even more lately than we ever have before. Um, so if you see someone is making a contribution to the health and safety and wellness of the Burlington community, um, you can consider nominating them for a Roots of Prevention Award next year. If you keep nominating, we'll keep doing this every year. Um, um, and uh, if you don't think it fits right in with our mission, just tell them anyway, um, because people need to hear it. Um, so supporting prevention comes in many forms. Um, for some of like our awardees, it's the donation of their time and their expertise, but for others with financial resources, donations of funds can have a profound impact um, on improving outcomes in our community. So I just want to take a minute to um, acknowledge Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont, who's been a generous sponsor of this event um, for many, many years um, and helping us to reduce substance misuse in Burlington. Um, and also our board chair, Megan Peake, is here tonight. She works in community relations and health promotion at Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont um, and is a wonderful champion um, for helping us plan this event, for making connections with Blue Cross Blue Shield, and for lots of other great work in the community. Um, so thank you, Megan, too. Um, and thank you for everyone who donated um, auction items um, from... Um, uh, we had them donated from local artists and, and businesses. Um, so feel free to keep bidding. Like I said, the auction is open until tonight. At, um, it'll close at midnight, so until 11.59. Um, and um, last I checked, there was all sorts of um, cool things that, um, that were still fairly low. So you can keep bidding um, and get some great deals. Um, and I also want to say thank you to our wonderful staff. Um, they, it takes a lot, even for a virtual event, there's a lot of things that have to come together um, to put together an event. Um, and Steph and Evan and Reagan, who are all on tonight, um, worked really hard to make another virtual event special so that we can honor people. Um, it's not always easy to do that in a virtual way. I hope next year we'll be able to do it in person. Um, and I can give you all your awards um, in person and you can take it home with you that night. Um, but I'm really um, lucky to have this uh, amazing group of staff that help put all of this together um, so I can attend and be with you all and just enjoy it and be panic free because they do all the hard work. Um, and I just want to maybe leave us with um, a quote from one of my favorite community organizers. Um, who I quote often and probably have at a previous award celebration, um, uh, Margaret Wheatley, who believed in the power of people coming together. Um, so in one of her poems, just a little qu quick bit, she says, be brave enough to start a conversation that matters. Talk to people you know, talk to people you don't know, talk to people you never talk to. Remember, you don't feel fear people whose story you don't know. And real listening always brings people closer together. So tonight we heard a few new things, made some new connections, 
heard some new stories about what's happening um, in the community. And I wish for you that you can continue that, um, start some new conversations that lead to more positive changes for our community. Um, in particular around substance use, it's impacting everyone in the community in some way. Um, so I hope that we can change the way we think about it. So it becomes one of the issues like COVID where we wrap our energy and our resources around to prevent those long-term consequences. Um, because substance use prevention is not uh, the crisis. It's the steady long-term investment in policies and practices and education and community assets that prevent the constant need for crisis management. Um, and I encourage you to just keep planning those roots for, for prevention um, and help our community thrive um, in the coming future. So good night. I'm sorry we kept you a little bit longer, but thank you all for your time. Really appreciate you being here. Good night.